those of you who have been listening to the weather outside um, will be surprised to hear that Tom Scully has actually made it up from Washington because he threw his fortunes in with the uh, US Air Shuttle, which, none, which seemed to deliver him uh, to, to LaGuardia amidst the thunder. Um, and so we had planned to do a switch, but he's actually walking to the front of the room right now. Um, we're very fortunate to have uh, Tom Scully with us today. He is the second of um, the heads of CMS that we have with us this morning. Uh, since leaving CMS, uh, he's gone back to the private sector. Uh, he um, had, wears a couple of hats as a, a um, uh, uh, working in a legal practice focused on health regulatory matters, but also more relevant from the perspective of today's topic. Uh, he's also a partner at Welsh Carson, Welsh Carson Anderson and Stowe, a private equity investment firm where he focuses on healthcare investment. So he's going to talk to us about the future of healthcare investment, uh, or more precisely, the, uh, the approaching impact of health reform, winners, losers, and investment. Thanks. It was actually the Delta shuttle, and it really sucks. Part of my front now, it's there. <laughs> so take US Air if you have the opportunity. Uh, I have the, the blessing of doing 190 of these a year for the last seven years. So why I'm still doing that is beyond me. But anyway, I do spend half my time here with Walsh Carson. And some of you know Russ Carson, who's my founding partner and a uh, good friend, and I think is still one of the co-chairs of the Columbia Business School. So we have a lot of Columbia Business School ties and a lot of, a lot of friends there. So I'm glad to, to come and uh, be part of this. Uh, panel today, uh, especially after my old friend Mark McClellan. I do. I used to really like Mark, but then for for the first three years, I used to be able to say I was the best CMS administrator ever, and that was because I was the only CMS administrator ever. Because <laughs> I changed the name just to confuse people in 2001, and then Mark uh, got confirmed right after me. And actually, a sad little trivia fact: Mark and I are the only two CMS administrators that ever got confirmed, which is an unfortunate thing for Don Berwick, who's a friend of ours, who's not having as easy a time getting confirmed. Um, as we did. Mark could probably still get confirmed. I got confirmed 100 to nothing. I think if I was up today, probably be zero to 100. What do you think, Mark? Be probably pre um, it's a lot tougher to do uh, than it used to be. Um, and unfortunately, Don Bork is finding out that all, all politics and healthcare policy, unfortunately, get tied in together. So I'm going to talk. I missed a lot of Mark's talk because my shuttle was two hours late. Um, but uh, I'm going to dive into a kind of a broader ranging, and I was told a lot of your investors looking at the list, some of you aren't investors, so you might be uh, maybe talking past some of you. But I'm going to talk about investment in healthcare, where it's going, what's going to happen in the different sectors. And the reality is all the stuff, the policy and the investment future and the different sectors in healthcare really tie back into politics, what happened with the bill that just passed and what's going to happen in the next couple of years. Uh, and Mark and Bob will probably disagree with me, but that's what hopefully this is all about. So. Uh, let me jump into it and see if these slides, a little about Welsh Carson just in one slide. Welsh Carson is probably uh, certainly the most active, if not the largest, by dollar volume. I think after KKR bought HCA, they may have trumped everybody. Uh, but we've done probably more healthcare deals than, than anybody over the last 20 years. Uh, I've been there for seven, but just among some of the other companies we own, and this is a probably a year and a half old chart, but we back to US Oncology, which we just sold to McKesson a few months ago. Lincare, just to jump through the, the list here, uh, Quorum Healthcare, which is now a big chunk of community health systems, Ardent Healthcare, which is a hospital chain we own, uh, Medcath, which we used to be in, but not anymore. We used to own the third biggest dialysis company, which we just sold, Universal American, which is the second biggest Part D plan, which we are selling our Part D tomorrow to Caremark, which should be done. So we're in lots of different pieces of healthcare all across. The, we uh, are an 11th fund. It's about a $4 billion fund. We do half healthcare. So. We see almost everything that comes through in the healthcare world from the private equity side. And uh, so we try to, you know, and I'm supposed to be the guy that's tracking Washington more than anybody else. So hopefully that works. <laughs> anyway, so what is the issue on healthcare reform? Uh, does it create jobs? Healthcare reform is always controversial. I think most people outside of healthcare are so sick of hearing about it that they think it's creating jobs by filling up emergency rooms. But it is the single biggest domestic policy issue in the country. Uh, and it does drive a big sector of investment, and it certainly drives a big sector of Welsh Carson's investment. So I'm going to go through here, talk a little about investment and what the impact of the bill and what's going on in Congress now and what the changes are in, on in various sectors. And then I'm going to switch over to the politics because I think some of the current impacts are going to change. Uh, just to summarize up front a little bit, I don't think anything's going to pass, 
despite all the best intentions of Republicans in Congress and the group of six and President Obama, I think we're all positioning for 2012. But I do think there's going to be a lot of radical health care legislation in 2013 driven by the deficit, and I'll get into that. And that's going to change the scenario for a lot of people. So when you look at the bill that passed uh, last year, and Mark had little to do with the design, and Bob had a lot to do with the design, um, probably why it went well, I wasn't involved. The, uh, uh, it had a big impact on lots of people. So when you look at it, it really isn't. And it's a credit to you know the Democratic Party. They've been working on this for 40 years. Uh, and they were trying to get universal coverage through. And it's painful, but they got it done. So should they be excited? Uh, yeah, I mean, they, you have a, you're on a track to have universal coverage, something Mark has been for years, for for years, that I've been for for years. I mean, other than exactly the way they did it. Um, but it's a big accomplishment. And, uh, but it's not a reform plan. It's a access expansion plan. So if you're in the healthcare investment business, uh, which I'll get into, that's probably just about good for everybody. It's, not a, it's, not, it's hard to find a lot of losers in this. Uh, essentially, did a massive expansion of access funded by some fees and some Medicare cuts, which really I know some of you are in the provider world. But in historical terms, the cuts were ridiculously non-existent uh, by any rational standard of what's happened in the last 30 years. Um, and the expansions are big. So who are the winners? The hospitals were big winners, and I'll go through all these, you know, dialysis rehabs. Who are the big losers? Taxpayers, because you got a massive deficit, uh, and it's going on for as far as the eye can see, and you've set up a big, giant battle over entitlement cuts, tax increases, and other things that's going to come in 2013. And uh, despite the fact that it was pretty well camouflaged, there were quite a few tax increases in this bill last year, which nobody seems to want to talk about, but especially if you notice the little point nine increase on all of your HI taxes, which nobody seems to have noticed uh, that they kicked in as a result of that bill. There's quite a bit of taxes in here. So it's, uh, it's great if you're a fan of universal access, which I am. Uh, but, and it wasn't easy to get done. And I think Democrats deserve a lot of credit for that. As Mark knows, because he had to carry it out, I caught a lot of bullets passing the Medicare drug benefit, which passed by one vote in both houses. And I was almost killed repeatedly. In 2003, Mark got to implement that thing. Uh, Health care reform is a hell of a lot tougher than the prescription drug benefit was. And so for Nancy and Minda Parle, an old friend of all of ours, or Bob and others were involved in it, you know, it's quite an accomplishment. I don't know how you, you know, whether you pass it by one vote. Uh, I might not have done it by party line the way they did it, and I think that's part of the political problem they have. But uh, sometimes the curse has 60 votes in the Senate. We had 57 votes in the Senate in 2003, so we had to go back and find a bunch of Democrats to support the prescription drug benefit because we didn't have any choice. Uh, President Obama last year in his position where he had a big majority in the House, he had 60 votes in the Senate, and he essentially played chicken with Republicans and said, you know, if you don't come cut a deal with me, I'm going to run it, I'm going to cram it down your throats, and for better or worse, that's what happened. But immediately, you've got a political jihad with no middle ground. Every Republican is for repeal, 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 and they have no clue what they're talking about in the substance, but they're for repeal. And every Democrat's saying, I don't want to change a thing, even if the thing's too big. So, uh, you know. I wrote an editorial, which probably you guys don't read the Washington Post if you're smart, just before the thing passed, saying, I wish they'd move five degrees to the middle because this thing might be sustainable. Uh, it's now a political war, which our friend Don Berwick is caught in the middle of. Uh, I think his casualty of not being confirmed or even considered for the CMS administrator has nothing to do with Don Berwick. It has to be the fact that when you pass the biggest piece of legislation in 50 years and you send it up to the Hill uh, when it's totally partisan, the next guy in line is going to get shot. <laughs> Don Burwick was the next guy in line. So it's, it's a tough thing. But from an investor point of view, there ain't too many losers. It's pretty good for everybody. So I can barely see my own things here. But when you look at it, if you're in the healthcare world, it's all fun for the next couple of years. I'd say look out in 2013. But for right now, trying to find somebody who got whacked on the healthcare field in this bill uh, is pretty hard. Hospitals win. The, the only real losers, and they probably should be, hopefully not in this room, are insurance agents because uh, exchanges have been a long time of coming, and you know the one thing in common is cutting out the eight or ten or eleven percent that, that we have an overhead from from private insurance agents selling policies to small groups was was a goal from the beginning, and people say, "Wow, that's a radical idea." Well, if you go back and look at that, I'm showing my age. Um, in 1992, the two primary authors of the George W. Bush George H. W. Bush plan were me and Dick Darman, who's since passed, sadly. So I guess I can claim to be the remaining author of that. And if I gave you a copy of that uh, with no title on top of it, uh, the structure of it looks a hell of a lot like the Obama plan. It has exchanges, health insurance networks. It structurally looks pretty much the same way. And the whole goal was to put people in local insurance exchanges. So the structure of the Obama plan is not wild. It's not a big government takeover. It's pretty much mainstream, standardized stuff. What's wild about it is that they put a huge amount of money into it. 
and arguably put, which I'll get into as well, a lot of money into Medicaid faster than the system's going to be able to spend it or to stomach it, and a lot of money in the exchanges and benefits package that may or may not be affordable. But the structure is not wild. Uh, and I think anybody that tells you it is, and it's complete big government takeover, forgets the fact that Republicans invented the individual mandate, which people tend to forget. That was our idea because we didn't like employer mandates. If Mark remembers, I think Mark was involved in that debate. So unfortunately, if you're in Washington long enough doing health care policy, it's kind of like a dog chasing its tail. People forget who did what. Uh, but it's, uh, it, it was, that was originally a Republican idea. So where's the market going? Uh, where the market is going is big program expansion in Medicaid, and I'll get to that. I don't think that's going to happen, by the way. Uh, huge private expansions through the exchanges. I'm not sure that's going to last, and I'll get into that too. Much more state and federal regulation oversight of commercial markets, which may or may not be a good thing. Uh, some people could argue that it's probably not a bad thing for consumers. Um, and I think a big consolidation, which you're already seeing in Part D, as I mentioned, we're selling the second biggest, Universal American, the care mark closes tomorrow. Uh, it's about 14% of the Part D market. Uh, I think in the commercial market and in the Part D market and the MA market, you're going to see a, the big get bigger and a lot of swallowing up and consolidation of the small insurance companies. I'll try to explain why as quickly as I can. So again, not a lot of big losers. And I'm not going to focus as I go forward here on the sectors and more on services than on biotech and prescription drugs because that's not really something that I know much about. But the big storm cloud, and I got drenched by one coming in here, so I'm big on storm clouds this morning. Uh, overriding this is this ain't going to last. Everybody's happy now, but you got, and this includes all the off-budget stuff, So, it's, but the, the fundamental number is a $1.6 trillion budget deficit, which means that we're collecting roughly 25%, we're spending 25% of GDP, which is historic high, outrageously high, uh, in spending, and we're collecting 145 to 15% of new investments you like. So we got a structural 10% of GDP deficit, and that's not sustainable. And you got the biggest new entitlement program, and I happen to be for universal coverage, uh, we never would have passed the Medicare drug benefit if we'd known we had these kind of deficits in 2003. This thing hasn't kicked in yet, and I don't believe it is going to. I think it's going to be stretched out and stretched out and stretched out by budget reality. So while well, everybody's happy now and it looks great now, uh, I don't think it's going to happen in the long run, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll give you more details on that. Hospitals, I love hospitals. I used to be the president of the Federation of American Hospitals. Uh, my company owns two big hospital chains. I love hospitals. I know there's a lot of people, that, people in the crowd. Uh, if this is hospital reform, God help us. <laughs> I mean, the money, the health care policy is not the money, it's the money. And the money's in hospitals. And I love hospitals, but there are a lot of hospitals. In fact, I used to say I was a CMS administrator, I was hoping that somebody could bring me to a hospital in the United States that did not have a crane in front of it, because almost every one of them does. Uh, and yet that's where the vast bulk of the money's going, and, and it's great. But a hospital-centric world is a problem, and if you're going to slow consumption and slow spending, pumping more money in the hospitals in every community in the country uh, is a, you know, that's a, it's a problem. Hospitals took virtually no cuts in this bill. And when you look at who the big winners were, you basically, in the back door, whether it's through DISH or IME or GME, terms of you don't know, every hospital in the country uh, that has high energy care levels, and New York has a lot of high energy care levels, gets significant backdoor subsidies through Medicaid and Medicare, about $45 billion. Teeny, teeny little bit of that was phased down over many years in this bill in exchange for Everybody in the country, theoretically, by 2014 or 15 or 16, walking in with some kind of insurance card. That's a pretty good deal. So I don't think it's going to last, but I would say you're going to keep the subsidies you got for the 10 to 12% uninsured, and you're all going to be walking in with insurance cards. Now, some of those people may be illegal aliens and other things that aren't covered, but the uninsured rate for the average hospital is theoretically going to drop from 10% to 2 or 3%, and you're going to keep the subsidies. I would say that's usually you'd sing Merry Christmas if it was the right time of year. Uh, it may not last, but the hospitals had a very good year and cut a very good deal. Uh, on other areas that some of you may in invest in, rehab hospitals, very minor impact in the bill. Uh, they're worried about post-acute bundling. I don't think that's a big threat. It's a great idea. Uh, it's been sitting around for a long time. I think I first put it in the 1989 George Bush budget. It hasn't happened yet. Probably won't happen anytime soon. Uh, it's a wonderful concept. that probably should happen, but I don't think anybody knows how to do it. So I wouldn't worry too much if you're in the rehab business. The LTEX, we own the biggest chain of LTEX, Truth and Advertising. They have some very narrow issues, but I think the long-term acute care hospital world looks pretty stable. Hospice, and I'm guessing from the list in the crowd, some of your own hospices, may be the most screwed up policy payment system in the history of mankind. Uh, there is no payment policy for hospice, but it hasn't changed because everybody loves hospice. If anybody's had a family member in a hospice, they do a great job. But the payment system is nuts. Uh, and this is probably the one thing in Medicare that's most ripe for reform. Is it going to happen anytime soon? I would guess not. Uh, there's nothing in the bill, biggest health care bill ever, so hospice will probably march on relatively unchanged. But the hospice payment system makes absolutely no sense. 
Uh, skilled nursing facilities, which some of you may invest in and some of you may own just from looking at the, at the list. Uh, SNFs had their big regulation for the year supposed to come out yesterday. Uh, the nursing home community, the, the ones that are publicly traded, but they all saw a lot of debt, uh, had a big change. Their big regulatory change was called RUGS-4. If anybody knows what these guys know what RUGS-4 is. Well, RUGS-4, and they were worried they are going to take big, big, big cuts uh, when it was all drafted last year in, in, uh, in last year's bill. Well, when the regs came out, magically, they actually got accidentally, and it's not their fault, but they're kind of hiding and hope nobody notices, um, <laughs> which I don't blame them, but I think people have noticed. Uh, the base spending for nursing homes and Medicare is supposed to be about $30 billion a year, and magically it's going to be about $32 billion this year from what people can tell. And they're saying, oh, wow, that's, you know, they were hoping, they were afraid they're going to take a big cut, like 5 or 6% accidental cut, which is Mark and Bob knows happens when you take a big payment system like nursing homes and you restructure and reform it, and you throw all the marbles up in the air and you catch them and you hope it works out. Well, some of these new prospective payment systems work and some of them don't. Uh, and you have to rejigger them. Well, in this case, they basically overpaid by, depending on the number, 4 to 8%. So the nursing homes, if anybody who follow nursing home stocks or bonds, magically have all been quietly saying, hey, things look better than we expected. Uh, and that's not going to last. CMS totally understands it. People on the Hill totally understand it. Uh, and so it's probably not a bad thing. It's still a net positive for nursing homes. The rule turned out much better than they expected. Somebody's going to take some of the money back. But once the money's out the door, it's like bank robbers. It's kind of hard to get it all back. You know, the bills may be marked and died, <laughs> but some of them are going to get away. So it's probably a net positive for nursing homes, but uh, it, I think uh, in general, it's probably um, uh, they're not going to get to keep it all. There'll be a, some kind of either legislative or regulatory fix this year to take quite a bit of that back if you have a nursing home. Home health is a danger zone. It's been growing like a weed. Some of us went through this before. Again, this is in the people don't remember the history. When I left the first Bush White House in 19... Uh, let's see, I'm getting old, I can't remember. 1992, home health spending was $3 billion a year. In 1997, it was $18 billion a year. And people went, wow, how'd that happen? And they whacked them in 1997, and in 1998, it was $10 billion a year. So it went from $3 billion to 18 to 10. That's not going to happen again, but if you ask MedPAC or any analyst, home health margins in Medicare have been growing pretty fast. They're higher than the average, and they're on everybody's radar to come down. Now, everybody in the world wants to drive all these post-acute patients in the home health care because it's the best setting and it's the lowest cost setting and it's where people probably should be. And the home health care guys credibly say, well, why are you going to cut us? You know, we, we, we provide the best services with, the, with the, you know, the lowest cost of care and say, you're right. But that doesn't mean we should have 30% margins. We'd be happy to drive more round, you know, revenue to you with 22% margins. And that's kind of the debate that's going on. So in the long run, home health is a great investment. Uh, in the short run, they are on everybody's target to get squeezed. And the reason I'm in the red zone, they're really in everybody's, uh, from CMS's point, it's a very fragmented industry. It's very slowly getting rolled up. Uh, as I used to say in the old days, this changed every human being in the state of Louisiana actually owned a home health agency at one point. <laughs> so it was ripe for fraud. It has gotten a lot better. Uh, I think a lot of the fraud's gone, but it's still on everybody's target list. So if you're looking 10 years down the road, home health is going to continue to expand because it, it's a great benefit in the lowest cost setting. It's going to get better. It's going to consolidate. In the short term, there are a lot of high multiples out there, and you have to pay a lot to buy them, and it's probably overvalued. So I think most people think home health is going to get a squeeze in the next few years, but in the long run, home health is one of the answers. It's definitely the cheapest place to put patients, and there's more and more t uh, services that can be done in the home health setting. But uh, while everybody else, I think, is relatively safe for the next couple of years, home health probably is going to feel some squeezes. Uh, DME suppliers are in the middle of a competitive bidding. They seem to be faring, uh, getting through that reasonably well. There's a big competitive bidding thing that goes on for wheelchairs and for uh, diabetes test strips is the biggest thing and other, other products in this area. Uh, they, people thought it was going to be a disaster. Most of them are, seem to be doing pretty well, so I would say it's a mixed bag for them. Uh, kidney dialysis is a big sector, and I was formerly on the board of DaVita Healthcare, and before I went in the government and still do a lot of work for dialysis folks and in the, uh, for total advertising. But dialysis is kind of the little engine that could. It's a heavy, heavy Medicare dependent. 85% of the revenue comes from Medicare. Uh, they've done a great job with CMS over the last, since I was there really, and probably since Mark left, of having an extremely good, very straightforward relationship with CMS. Just the facts. They actually give them data and talk to them, which most people don't. As a result of that, uh, they happen to get regulations that are on the 50-yard line consistently. And so dialysis has become kind of the very predictable, maybe boring, but very predictable uh, reimbursement engine. They had a big, uh, their big reform was two years ago. Their big reg just came out this winter, and CMS not only didn't cut them, they actually put 3.1% back in their base on an argument that you could probably argue about, but 
Uh, reimbursement and policy for analysis is shockingly stable. So from an investment point of view, you're looking at the two big companies, Fresenius and DeVita, that probably have 75% of the market in the U.S., believe it or not, combined. They're both incredibly stable, boring, and sadly, people aren't getting any skinnier. And we're not getting any fewer people with diabetes. And so that market is, unfortunately, as a public health matter, going to continue to, go, to, to grow. Clinical labs uh, uh, is up every year. Every year there's a little tremor because somebody talks about putting in a clinical lab copayment for reasons I won't get into, but I'd be happy to get into questions. It never happens because it's just too hard to do and the money's too small. I think clinical lab services are also probably looking relatively stable and probably not going to get hit. Disease management is another one that I think is, uh, they had a, a demo that I had put in over my all violent objections by Congressman, Congressman Johnson in 2003 that Mark, I think, had to deal with. Uh, that really wasn't a fair test for disease management. It was poorly designed, but it gave all the disease management companies a black eye. So they've all, disease management five years ago was the hottest thing in healthcare. The last couple of years has been kind of flat and fading and not as hot. Uh, and I think this is kind of a silly argument. I mean, one man's disease management, which is out of fashion and not doing very well, is another man's chronic care management, which is great. Everybody wants to do chronic care management. That's a hot business, but, you know, it's kind of it's like changing the name Hickford to CMS, I guess. Um, so I think disease management is kind of out of favor right now. A lot of the companies that are publicly traded uh, are, are not particularly pop, hot right now. Uh, but I do think most of these guys are getting into what they should have been doing all along as ACOs develop, which is instead of doing medical call centers and patient management from a distance, they're going to start dealing with docs. And docs really do. As your two docs here know, doctors take care of patients, and they're the ones that change behavior. Uh, and I think disease management is going to become chronic care management, and these guys will get back into the weeds and start working with doctors to change behavior and through ACOs. And so I think that business actually may probably come back. Devices and suppliers, uh, you know, the uh, little hidden fact is that everybody's looking for money in the system, and I love all those medical device guys. They're great. I used to argue when they come in the lobby, me, we should, why wait to put an insertable cardiac defibrillator into patients when they're 70? Let's put them in at birth. That's what we should <laughs> <laughs> Why wait? Yeah, that's a lot of battery use, that's right. Um, but they, they do a great job, but they're never paid for directly, and their margins are unbelievable. So when you look at the net margins of the medical device suppliers, they're really untouchable. Nobody talks about them, but when you get into the, 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 the margins of medical devices, it's really kind of shocking. Uh, so I put them in the yellow field, because someday, with all the pressure we're going to have economically, somebody's going to wake up and say that's where a whole lot of the, of the money in the healthcare system is. But for now, they seem to be relatively safe. Uh, health insurers, MA plans, you know, a lot of screaming and bitching and moaning about MA plans being cut. And for those of you from New York, I spent most of the 90s on the board of Oxford Health Plans, which people forget, we made a lot of money at 95% of AEPCC all through the 90s. And I was on the board for eight years between Bush administrations. Uh, and the concept, if you're Republican, was that if you have $10,000 to spend and you give 9500 bucks to a private health plan, that doesn't fix prices and, or administer prices, as my Democratic friends say. They don't call it fixing prices. I'm just picking up <laughs> administered pricing, which I think doesn't work, uh, that they'll eventually drive to better providers and, and lower drug utilization and do other things, and they'll save money, which Oxford did and many other plans did all through the 90s. So the idea that this is a huge cut to go back to 95% of fee-for-service on a risk-adjusted basis up to 115% rural areas is kind of a joke. Um, I don't say it outside. There's no reporters here, hopefully. but. You know, there were only three people. Mark wasn't quite there yet. He was involved early on. But, you know, at the end of the day, there were three or four people involved in drafting the 2003 bill, uh, and it was a drafting error. We never intended to pay plans in Puerto Rico 180% of fee-for-service. We never intended to pay 130% of fee-for-service. It was a mistake. Uh, during the 90s, the, uh, and I, I won't torture you with the details, but in, accidentally in 1987, Congress cut Medicare HMOs and drove them out of ur urban areas to the point where by the time we came in in 2003, in Detroit, Philadelphia, Chicago, payments were down to 82, 84% of fee-for-service, and nobody was left. And we had 4.5% of people in Medicare managed care, which happens to be a great product for low-income people, in my opinion. Uh, so we made it, you know, in designing Medicare Advantage, which was, by the way, the Oxford name, which we stole, uh, for those of you who remember Oxford Health Plans. Um, the uh, Medicare Advantage, we designed it and basically said, we got to get all these providers, all these insurers that don't trust us back into the business. How do we do that? We'll prime the pump a little. So for the first couple of years, we were intending to make a 4 6 and 8% add-on and then phase it out. Well, we drafted the bill, and we all left, the people who were doing it, which were basically mm -hmm. Senator Grassley's staffer and Congressman Thomas's staffer and me. And I remember we ran into each other on the street a couple of years later when the, when, the, when the regs came out, and Mark, <laughs> Mark just did do what the law said and said, how the hell did that happen? The rates were like 125% of fee-for-service. 
And the Democrats started attacking you, saying, you're overpaying managed care plans. And you know what? They were right. If you really believe in private health care, you really believe that you're going to get more efficient in a private health care sector out of a, out of a private health plan dollar than out of the government fixing prices through CMS. So what's happening is you're now coming back and rationalizing the MA rates. It's totally the right thing to do. I was always a big fan of MA, not because I love private insurance plans. I was always a big fan of MA because Medigap is rotten insurance, and most people don't realize it. And the reason that, that, that Medi Medicare Advantage is going to do well in the long run has nothing to do with private insurance versus public insurance. It has to do with the fact that if you go out and ask your mother, my mother's a Medicare beneficiary, what are your options if you get really angry because you used to have this great deal from Humana where you got a great drug benefit with very low copayments and very low deductibles because they were overpaid, at, you know, so, you know, essentially oversubsidized for a while, and you're angry because your, your rate in Pittsburgh just went from zero to 150 bucks a month, and I'm not taking any more. You know, we call your Medigap provider and say, I want to come back, and they'll say, great, how about 600 bucks a month? And that's the reality why Medicare Advantage is going to keep growing, because especially for low-income beneficiaries, they can't go back. Medigap, which is private insurance that has nothing to do with Medicare, is a very bad deal for seniors. It's extremely expensive, and there's no way to go back. Uh, and so when you're looking at Medicare Advantage, especially for low-income people on a budget, it is the option. It's not going to grow. You know, it went from 4.5% of the population of seniors when I got into CMS to about 25% now. It's not going to go to 50 or 60, but it's going to continue to inch up for pure economic reasons. It's a better deal for seniors than Medigap. So the idea that, Medi that Medicare Advantage business is going to fall apart and go away is just, I don't think, not correct. Uh, it's going to be a good business. It's going to continue to grow, and I think it's consolidate. So if you're looking at the Humana or United or Aetna or anybody that's in this business in a serious way, they're going to get more regulated. They're going to get more oversight from CMS. Uh, they're going to get 5% margins, which is what an insurance company probably should have. Uh, and they're going to get a little more scrutiny, but it's not a bad business. It's a very good business, and I think it's going to continue to be a good business. Commercial insurance reforms. You know, you can debate how the exchanges are going to go, and a lot of this may change with, you know, a huge number of Republican governors pushing back. I think they're going to be, have to be given a lot of discretion about how to drive the exchanges. Um, so I don't think this is going to be as controversial, but it's going to scramble a lot of eggs. So if you look at states like Tennessee, which President Obama likes to pick out, or, or Alabama, which are totally dominated by one Blue Cross plan, well, you go in there and have an exchange, that's a very easy way for a new market entrant to get into a market. So if you, uh, if you were, I remember when Oxford years ago tried to get into Philadelphia, we got squashed by Blue Cross, Independence Blue Cross, which totally dominates Philadelphia. It's very hard to break in. But if you have a structure like the Federal Employee Health Benefits Plan where you can go in and say, aha, this exchange is going to do the marketing. I'm not going to have to go through agents. I'm going to have e equal access to all these beneficiaries coming in. <laughs> you probably didn't hear anything I've been saying for the last hour. <laughs> The, uh, I think it's going to change the dynamics a lot, and probably for the better. So if you're a local blue that dominates the small group market, it's going to be a lot easier for Aetna and Cigna and United to come in and compete with you, and that might be a little scary, and it might shake up the blues. But I think more than really changing the insurance system, it's going to really shake up a lot of stuff. The ERISA market's going to change. The Blue Cross markets are going to change. The small group markets are going to change. If for the better or for the worse, it's just going to create a lot of uncertainty among commercial insurers. Um, I think, you know, for some people you may find uh, that it's, I think for a lot of the publicly traded plans, you may find it's a good thing because they're going to get all kinds of new access, easy access to market into new small group markets, uh, despite all the complaining and yelling about it. And agents, once again, uh, I would not want to be an insurance agent in the next 10 years. I think they're going to slowly phase out. There's just not going to be a lot of reason for them, and it's, it's going to be, the reason is it's going to be a more efficient market that's run. So exchanges, my own view, and again, this will vary by state. I think state exchanges you'll end up having in most states two or three or four. Uh, a lot of this is going to be up to what HHS lets them do and what the governors do, but I think you can have regional exchanges that will offer a lot of different plans. Um, I think there going to be a lot of other businesses that grow out of this. I think risk adjustment, which has become a pretty big business as a result of some changes we made in Medicare. If you're really looking at exchange and you've got five or six or ten health plans in Philadelphia, and you're looking at making sure that they operate equally and they're not cherry picking, eventually you're going to have to do risk adjusted payments among them. And so there's going to be a whole lot of kind of sub businesses growing out of, in my opinion, all these insurance reforms that people aren't thinking about right now, which is probably a good thing. I mean, the nature of, uh, you know, one of the better things I think we did, and Mark did carry this out, was put risk adjusters in Medicare. Because for those of you who remember the complaint about Medicare HMOs in the 90s, it was that Oxford or Humana would have their enrollment office on the 50th floor of a walk up. And we'd hand out gym memberships and only recruit healthy people, which probably wasn't true, but certainly that was the financial incentive. If you paid 10000 bucks a year for everybody, you're going to find healthy people and make money and avoid the sick people. Uh, well, now that we have risk adjustment in the Medicare sector, insurance companies chase the sickest people they can find. They want to find a $50,000 patient because if they get paid 50000 bucks for a very high-risk 92-year-old person with many comorbidities and they can manage their care really well for 42000 bucks a year, they make an $8,000 margin. 
you can't make an $8,000 margin on when Medicare is paying you $8,000. So it's totally flipped. Risk adjustment has totally flipped all the incentives of Medicare for insurance companies very much as was intended to do. And I think you're going to find a lot of that going on in the commercial sector. And what you're going to find is it's going to encourage insurance companies to find sick people and manage them as opposed to avoiding sick people, which is exactly what you would hope would happen in insurance reforms. Medicaid HMOs, I think, you know, you can, you can argue about what the, the pain the states are going to go through, but I haven't seen a governor yet that didn't feel fiscal pressure, didn't say, what's my answer? One of my answers is going to Medicaid managed care and going to capitation and cutting costs. And you know what? You're not going to get Centene or Molina or Amerigroup, the biggest ones, to show up. You know, they're low margin, high volume businesses. They make 3% margins. And they take care of high volume of low income Medicaid patients. Well, you, they're not going to show up and bid on state business for less than 3% margins. And the business isn't going to shrink. It's going to get bigger. So whether you believe all the Medicaid expansion you're going or not, there's going to be a hell of a lot more people going to Medicaid managed care. And those guys bid on low margin, high volume contracts. And those things, there's just no way in the world those populations are going to get smaller. If the bill holds up and the Medicaid expansions go through, there's going to be a ton of cash going in there. And even if they get delayed, there's still going to be a ton of cash going in there. So my own view is if you're looking for a place that's, again, a little like dialysis, predictable, boring, despite all the nervousness about Medicaid, Medicaid managed care plans are not going away. They're going to get bigger. Uh, Part D, and Bob won't agree with this one, but, you know, closing the donut hole may have been the dumbest policy in the history of mankind with a, <laughs> with a $1 trillion annual uh, deficit. The fact that we're going to give some guy playing golf in Naples who's worth $20 million bucks, uh, closing his donut hole and give him a lower deductible in Part D is really a disgrace as a matter of public policy. Uh, when we designed Part D, there is nobody, uh, the, the, uh, un, you know, the, uh, of the 45 million people on Medicare, 15 million of them are poor, and they have no donut hole, and they have no deductibles, and they have no co-payments, and if you're poor, you pay for nothing, basically, uh, in, in the drug benefit. As you go further up in the income stream, all these other wealthier people, like all of you in the room that may turn 65, uh, pay some co-payments and deductibles, and pretty significant ones. By the way, you used to get no drug benefit. So now what you do, and the reason that what you found that the Medicare Part D plans had 75 to 85% generic substitution is because all these smart seniors who aren't poor on January 1st started calling up and saying, wait a minute, why the hell am I taking you know, Lipitor when I could be taking Mevacor? And they changed the generics. And why am I taking Nexi when I could take Paralysec? Uh, because they're very sensitive to cost, and they all switch to generics in big ways. So what happens if you start closing the donut hole? It probably sounds like great politics, one of the greatest. You might as well just burn the money. I mean, you're going to drive people back to name brand drugs. It's a huge waste of money, a bad idea. Is it going to hurt the Part D programs? No, it just gives them more revenue. And as a business matter, it doesn't make a big difference. But it's really bad policy. Um, and I think you're going to find more and more people going into Part D as a result of that. Likewise, there's an obscure policy, which got a lot of attention from the Wall Street Journal last year, uh, to, to where we're shrinking the retiree drug subsidy for large employers. They're going to more and more dump people into Part D. So the bottom line is people that are in Part D, which is mainly United, Humana, and now CVS, it's a good business. It's going to keep growing, and it's going to get better. Uh, commercial PBMs, I just saw this morning coming in here and, uh, from the airport that Medco announced a great quarter. I still think Medco and Caremark are good businesses. Long run life to go off on trying to squeeze drug companies and have better margins, so I think life looks pretty good for them too. And I'm probably running behind, so let me just I'll skip through the medical devices and HIT I talked about. It. Anyway, in the big picture, I couldn't find, because I've been on the road all week, totally updated numbers, but just to switch back to the bigger picture of why this party is going to get uglier. Well, these are 2009 numbers, but you get a deficit structurally this year of 11% of GDP. This said for 2009, 9.9% .9 of GDP. All the numbers are going on the wrong, wrong way. Uh, receipts are ridiculously low. Outlays are ridiculously high. Uh, raising taxes, you know, when you look at raising taxes, you can do that to some degree, but I'm a partner in a private equity firm. I'm still looking for people that have had a whole lot of carried interest the last few years. <laughs> it's a, uh, there haven't been a lot of corporate income taxes received the last few years, and these numbers in 2010 were about the same. Uh, cap gains are going down. So when the economy is stalling out, revenue is going down. So expenditures are going way up. Revenues are going down. Uh, you can't tax your way out of this even if you want. There's not enough people up there. You're going to have to make some very radical changes. So that really gets you to what's going to happen after this presidential election. And I certainly hope, as a citizen, they do something this year. But I've been in Washington, sadly, since 1980, which is even longer than Mark. And, and you're like 100 years old. Uh, the, uh, and I just don't think anything is going to happen. It's all about posturing. The, uh, the, uh, the, the Republicans are scared to death to really, you know, if you look when Paul Ryan came out with his budget, which in my opinion was a credible effort to really do something tough. Uh, if you saw the response of most Republicans in the Senate was, where's the door? It looks like <laughs> they, they didn't want to talk about it because they're all worried about their elections and they, people don't do things that are tough before an election. So 
uh, you know, the, the issues here, are, you can look around as long as you like, and I've been involved in a lot of, you know, I was very involved in the 1990 budget deal and a couple of since then. Uh, you know, you can talk about trimming federal spending and cutting down waste, fraud, and abuse and uh, cutting highway building. That's not where the money is. The money's in taxes, defense, Medicare, Social Security, Medicaid, and there's no place else to go. And since you really uh, aren't going to do that much with Social Security, it really comes down to Medicaid. So who's going to take the lead on this? President Obama, uh, again, not to offend him, but when the Washington Post uh, comes out, as they did the day after his budget came out, and again, most of you don't read this, but the Washington Post is not known for being an extremely conservative newspaper, for those of you who don't follow it. And their lead editorial the day after his budget came out was punter-in-chief. Uh, that's not a good sign that somebody's going to show a lot of spine on dealing with the deficit issue. So he has come back in the last couple weeks, done a little bit more. Uh, obviously, you got the House Republicans with Ryan, you know, taking a slightly more aggressive view. You got a lot of these new freshmen in the House taking a pretty aggressive view. Uh, the gang of six, which is three Republican senators and three Democratic senators led by Mark Warner, a Democrat from Virginia, who I happen to be particularly fond of, are all trying to do the right thing. But when you look at a gang of six, the guys that are really trying to change the world and do the right thing, they have one thing that's a common denominator. Either they're not running for election, which is two of them, or they have 85% re-elects. I mean, Mark Warner could run against God and win probably right now in Virginia. So uh, you start talking about guys that have close races, like a Ben Nelson from Nebraska or a Bill Nelson from Florida, they don't want to talk about this stuff at all. So that means it's probably not going to happen, sadly, before the next election. So, you know, this bill is a great bill, and God bless people who are in for, most people in this health in this world, for, uh, in this room, for trying to be for universal coverage is great, but it is unbelievably expensive. It's the biggest new entitlement program in the history of mankind. And that's not even counting that spending before you look at the structural 10% of GDP debt we have. So it's pretty tough. This slide, unfortunately, didn't work out too well. I don't want to miss something on there. But so what was the net cost when it passed? It was it was advertised as a budget saver, and in theory, over the next 10 years, it was a little bit of you know you can argue about how you play with the numbers. The cost over the first 10 years was 940 billion. Uh, it's probably as of some new Medicaid numbers that came out the other day, more like 1.3 trillion. Um, and the net impact of that was supposed to be positive because you were going to, and how did they get there? They cut Medicare and Medicaid a little bit over the years, and they raised taxes and did a bunch of other fees. So in net, it theoretically saves money. The reality is it had new tax increases and very marginal reductions in future pr pr programs, prospective growth in exchange for real actual spending. So what's going to happen most likely in the real world when you get around 2013 and you have real actual spending kicking in 2014 and kind of a lot of other fees and other stuff? If you're sitting there at OMB, which I used to do, you're going to keep the money and delay the spending. <laughs> that's not real hard to figure out, and I think that's what's likely to happen. Now, people will scream and yell, but there's no place else to go. So I'm almost finished. If you get to 2013, what's likely to happen? You're probably going to have, and I don't know how many Republicans there are. There are, there are only apparently two Republicans in New York City, so I doubt there's too many in this. Um, uh, the, uh, how many Republicans there are? I mean, realistically, it's very likely President Obama is going to get reelected. If the economy is doing better and he runs you know, reasonable campaign, it's pretty likely he's going to get reelected. He, he might not, but he, he probably will. Uh, is it likely Republicans are going to lose the House? Very unlikely. This is a flat number to roughly where they are now, but Republicans have a huge advantage in redistricting. The population still moving south and west. That's where Republicans are stronger. Very hard to see how Democrats take the House back. It could happen, but it's unlikely unless the Republicans really, really, really screw up. So I think most objective observers don't see that happening. There are 33 people up in the Senate. Uh, 23 of those 33 are Democrats. There are basically two Republicans that have tough races, and their tough races are coming from their right. So those seats are going to remain Republican, most likely. Scott Brown could lose in, in, in Massachusetts, probably the only one. There are at least 10 Democrats where the seats are in trouble, and they're probably going to lose them. So most objective observers, I pick kind of the, I think this is a conservative range, which you see after the next election is President Obama, big Republican majorities in a very conservative House, and 53 Republicans in the Senate. What is that T up for? It tees you up for a 1990 or a 1997. These guys are going to have to deal with the deficit. They're going to have to deal with a big budget deal. It's going to be an ugly year, which means the budget deficit year 2014. So if you're in the healthcare business looking at investment or policy, you're probably in pretty good shape for the next couple of years. But if you're not looking at 2014, you're crazy because there's no way they can keep kicking this can down the road. It's going to happen. So what's a big budget deal between a relatively popular Democratic president and a very conservative Republican House? They're not going to raise taxes. Of course, they're going to have to raise taxes. There's no way around it. So they don't raise taxes. They do tax reform. They get rid of a whole bunch of deductions, and they'll trim all kinds of 
They may get rid of the, a big chunk of the health care, what's now the Cadillac tax in their form bill, which is really about as bad social policy as it gets. They should have done a lot more. They may very tightly cap the tax deductibility, excludability of health care, which I think Mark has been for for years, as have I. Uh, they may do something on mortgage deduction. They may flatten the rates. They may trim down all the deductions we all take and rationalize the tax code. And they won't call it a tax increase, but magically more revenue will appear <laughs> than appeared before. And they won't get rid of the Bush tax cuts because Republicans can't do that. They'll rationalize the tax code. They'll call in an old Dick Army press releases or something, and they'll declare that they have a fair tax system, but magically they'll manage to get 15 or 20 percent more revenue out of it. They'll cut defense because they're going to have to and because hopefully these wars will be left. But what's the other biggest moving piece? And again, some of you may not agree with me, but if you have the choice as a politician of cutting Medicare beneficiaries, cutting Medicare, cutting Social Security and existing beneficiaries are saying, you know what, I'm for universal coverage. I love it. It's a great thing. It's a wonderful social goal. But we got a 10% of GDP structural deficit and we can't do it in 2014. How about 2017? And then it'll become 18 and 19. And I'm sure Democrats will worry about this. But the single easiest way politically to do deficit reduction in 2013 is going to be to delay the health care bill. And I'd be stunned if that doesn't happen. So for all the people in the healthcare field that are counting on this new money coming in through exchanges and Medicaid expansions, I wouldn't count your chickens uh, because these things are all tied together. I just don't think it's going to happen. So I think you have to delay that. The other thing is it's very tough. If you're in the hospital world or the nursing world, you say, oh, my God, 2014 means big, big, big cuts in Medicare and in doc fees and in nursing home fees. I don't think that's going to happen either because, you know, you get every community in the country, what you get to do is CMS administrator, which Mark probably got dragged into every small <laughs> hospital in the country, too, when he was doing it with, for congressional town hall meetings. Who's the most popular guy in every community in the country? In most cases, it's the only employer left, the hospital administrator. And it's very tough to cut hospitals. It's very tough to cut a lot of these big institutions. So the cuts are going to be minor. So what are they going to do? Push off health reform. Minor cuts, like they did last year in Medicare, Medicaid baseline. Nobody actually ever gets a cut. You get a reduction of increase from 3.5% to 2.5%. And the thing that's really going to happen, and this is where the big money is, and people are going to have to start talking about it or none of this is going to get fixed, you've got to raise the retirement age of Social Security and Medicare. Uh, how many people here know what the Social Security retirement age is right now? Does anybody know? <coughs> you want to guess? 65 years and 10 months, which most people don't know that but because the health reform they did years ago in Social Security, but back in a big deal with Senator Moynihan and Jim Baker back in 1983, they decided 10 years ago to start raising the Social Security retirement age one month at a time over 24 years. We're 10 years into it. Hardly anybody's noticed until you call up at 65 and say, I'd like my Social Security check. And they say, you go wait a few more months. There's an enormous amount of money saved in there. And so what rational people are talking about is saying, let's take the Medicare retirement age and the Social Security retirement age, because we're all living earlier, and over 48 years, which is... Four year, which is one month for 48 years, gets you from 65 to 69. That is the single structural thing. You can cut Medicare, you can cut hospitals all day long, do whatever you want. The one thing that's going to get us out of the budget hole in the long run and save money is moving the retirement age for Social Security and Medicare one year at a time, outside the horizon of being running for election right now, starting five years after they've all retired, and do it over 48 years, and that completely changes the math on the trust funds and completely changes the math on Social Security and Medicare. That's why you see guys like Paul Ryan talking about it. You see people in the administration tossing out once in a while. You know, the ARP won't like it. Well, the ARP never likes anything. I know somebody's here from the ARP, so I love you guys, but... <laughs> you know, the, the, there's fewer members joining the ARP if you raise the retirement age, but that's a long way off. But it's the only way to make the math work, and I think what's going to happen. So um, just to wrap up real quickly... Um, this, you know, I think I went through all this. It, it, it's, you know, you're, you're going to have to do some significant reforms. Delaying the health care reform bill a few years at a minimum, I think, will happen. Raising the retirement age will happen. And a lot of structural things that go back in health care. But if you're looking at health care and if you're looking at the investment world, the safest place to be in the investment world the last 30 years has been health care. Uh, the safest place the next 30 years is going to be health care because it's the government and things change slowly. Uh, and I always say, you know, I started working in the Senate in 1980. And if you can think about the really big changes in the healthcare system since 1980, they're probably DRGs and RBRBS, and 99.9% .9 of Americans have no idea what the hell a DRG and RBRBS is. <laughs> so if you look at the real radical changes that happened in healthcare over the years, it's not much. Uh, and there are big programs that are politically uh, maybe tough on taxpayers, say, at the bottom. But uh, they're hard to change. And from an investment point of view, these things are always spooky because it's politics you don't understand. But they're much more stable than you realize in the long term. And I think they're going to continue to be. So just to wrap up for my last slide, because this is the fundamental problem here. This is my Medicare toaster, which is really the problem. The kid says, I don't understand how this happens. Every time I put in four pieces of bread, I put in four, pops up, and I get one, and Grandpa gets three. <laughs> 
And that is unfortunately our fundamental problem. As long as grandpa, who's not poor, keeps getting three, we're gonna have big problems. Anyway, thank you all very much. Good luck getting back, Mark. I hope you do better tonight coming up. <laughs> See ya. I guess I can take some questions now before we break, or is this good? Do you guys, do you want, if anybody has any questions or wants to throw something at me, you're welcome to do it. Yeah. Uh, the people, the people say that, okay. People, uh, you hear that G, uh, healthcare is a certain percent of, a, of GDP in America, you know, 16% or whatever it is. That's a lot higher than Europe. And the thought process is, well, we got to get to the same kind of 10% range that it is in Europe. But how do you get an industry to go from 16% to 10% of GDP without a 2% recession for three years? Matt, that's never going to happen. I think it's 18.5% of GDP. And I remember, I, for those of you really old, I remember I started working, it was actually accurately in January of 1981 for Slade Gordon. I think you're from Washington State, aren't you? who was a senator from Washington State that I started working for, you know, one of my first jobs. And his, one of his, and a great guy, a very smart guy, he went out on the Senate floor, health is out of control, unsustainable, 6% of GDP, we gotta stop it. And, you know, the fact is it was 6% of GDP and it was unsustainable, and the fact is we haven't stopped it, and it's gonna keep growing, and it's not gonna go from 18.5% back down to 16 or 10. The hope is that it goes from 18.5% slowly to 19, the 19.5 to 20. Uh, yeah, and I think that that's just a reality because people want to consume health care and people don't want to be told no in this country and they're behaviorally used to it. So as uh, our mutual fund, I assume Uwe Reinhardt always says, you know, this is never going to stop because people are going to spend their resources in a wealthy company what they want and the one thing you're not going to be able to tell them no on is health care. On the other hand, we do a lot of really stupid stuff that we should change. And as CMS administration, it's tough politically. So like, just to give you one example, is anybody here from AstraZeneca? I hope not. You know, in the four years, I, three years I did CMS, and probably since I haven't given one speech without beating the hell out of Nexium, because I think it's outrageous. I mean, Nexium is Prilosec, uh, and Bob is a doctor, and I, and I did all three, because, you know, I don't have any problem with Nexium. If you want to take Nexium, God bless you, but it's 90 bucks a month for a name brand drug, whereas Prilosec, which is the same drug, is over the counter generic for seven, eight, nine bucks a month. And what's the difference? And they're smart guys, but this happens to lots of drug companies, just pick on them. I only care about it because of Medicaid. You know, AstraZeneca had Prilosec coming off patent. They raised the price of solids, Prilosec, came out with Nexium, the purple pill, shadow price to just below, got everybody hooked on Nexium for six months, right? And Prilosec came off patent, went generic. Purple pill ads, bombing the world. I couldn't care less if you want to buy the purple pill. But when you run Medicaid, we were spending 350 million bucks a quarter on Nexium. So why, you know, when you spend 90 bucks a month on a low-income woman in Mississippi buying Nexium, that's money you're not spending on their kid for obstetrical care or something else. That's just bad policy. So there are a million examples like that where you could just change behavior and have people do stuff that's more rational. You know, I love the device companies. We own one. But, you know, the reality is at some point, why should the government, and I got beaten up when I was running CMS. There was a front-page story in the Washington Post just to tell you how ugly this gets because uh, insurable cardiofibrillators, which I joke about, we put a lot of ICDs in a lot of people, and the companies wanted to put a lot more in. Uh, Guiden, in particular at the time, run by a particularly aggressive CEO, really had a big lobbying can to beat me up because we were starting to have, ask questions about who got an insertable cardio fibrillator at 30, 42,000 bucks. Well, Medicare doesn't pay for insertable cardio fibrillators. We paid for the hospital stay, which at the time was 42,000 bucks. And the average hospital stay dropped from three days to two days. And I said, oh my God, Maybe in a staff recommendation, we should reduce the reimbursement from 42,000 bucks to 39,500. All of a sudden, I got bombed, huge PR campaign, doctors all the country writing about what a terrible non-doctor lawyer was cutting all the reimbursements. Front page article in the Washington Post, you can go back and look it up in 2003. Dick Cheney, who had one, would be dead if it was up to Tom Scully, all planted by the companies. <laughs> I'm not kidding. You can buy a damn good insurable cardio fibrillator made in Russia for 4,000 bucks. Now, they're a wonderful technology, but they cost about depending how you ask, a certain amount to make, and they get billed out at 38,000 bucks a year, a, a, a unit, 38, 37, 38,000 bucks a unit, and the hospital stays nothing. It's all the cost of the ICD. And it's a great technology, and you know, if I had a bad heart, I'd want one too. But somebody needs to start asking the question, what the hell do they cost? And I'm a capitalist. <laughs> I don't like fixing prices. 
Um, so Medicare can't ask, it's a tough issue. My own view, and was one of the reasons I'm a big fan of commercial insurance companies, is if you give all that money to that and their Blue Cross and put their cash at risk, at some point they're gonna ask questions a lot tougher uh, than my very well-intentioned, wonderful staff sitting in Baltimore who are writing checks out of the trust fund and they go home at five o'clock and they don't worry about it. You know, your evil capitalist taxpayer dollars, I mean, uh, uh, investor dollars at work, people are gonna start asking tough questions. So you know, I think when you're asking about how do we get from 18.5% back down, we're never going to get back down. But I happen to believe that the forces are going to drive more. You know, the only place in the country, I'm getting way offline here, or that we fix prices in health care. And I love the Medicare program. I think it's a wonderful social benefit. But the main reason our health care system is so screwed up, in my opinion, is because for 55% of the volume of the patients and services, Medicare and Medicaid, the government fixes prices. And price fixing has never worked in any economy, in any society ever in the history of mankind. And as wonderful as Medicare is, it doesn't work here. Every doc in New York City and every hospital in New York City gets paid the same thing. And what happens when you pay everybody the same thing? You get volume explosions and everybody's surprised. <laughs> so you say, why am I a big fan of Medicare Advantage? It's not because I love Aetna or United or it's because I like people that don't fix prices and actually ask questions and say, Bob's a really good doctor. Maybe we should pay him at whatever I'm guessing is age 40. Uh, Maybe we should pay him more than his internist, the just resident that just got out who's 28, who doesn't have any training. But we don't, we pay him exactly the same thing. So what happens when you get that? The guy who's the best doc coming out of uh, you know, Columbia Presbyterian gets angry and gets mad because he's getting paid the same as the kid that just came out of the residency training. And he goes off and says, I'm gonna make up for it by investing in an MRI center. <laughs> and we're all surprised. We shouldn't be surprised. So I think it's, you know, people follow the behavior follows financial incentives, and the financial incentives drive exactly where we're getting. Do I have any more questions that I wear you guys out? I wore you guys out. Sorry about that. Anyway, thanks for your patience.